Hello and welcome to uh, Microbiology, uh, well I guess this uh, Microbiology Journal Club, I guess? Are we, are we, yeah, yeah. That, it's the off week, right? Yeah. We do the news and the <laughs> headlines. Although I am quite pl happy to announce that we've reached 100, su 100 subscribers, so that my YouTube channel is now called uh, youtube.com slash c slash defective brain. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, because the previous <laughs> name was not very good at all. Uh, anybody who knows about it will, well, it's best not to like mention it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's exciting. That's a, it's a good milestone. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I had so yeah, uh, and this week we're going to be talking about the latest news about microbiology and especially pertaining to the coronavirus outbreak because that's basically the biggest story we at the moment. Um, Yep. Yeah, and then we're gonna and then try to choose something for reading next week. Yeah, <laughs> looking at the which paper we're gonna really dig into next week. To yeah, so uh, I... and this has been our this has been our uh, sort of weekly breakdown, right? Uh, alternating weeks to sort of lighten up, give it a break a little bit, so we're not always diving into the papers. And there's so many papers, yeah. right? It's like it deserves the time to sift through a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. We. <clears throat> You really do need to go through, like, well, yeah, there's so much out there, and we can't cover everything in depth, so getting a first yeah, look on papers, exactly. getting our first impressions out, is a really important thing to, to have. Um, totally. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and if any viewers want to suggest papers that we should incorporate, uh, please tweet us with, with our hashtag or our uh, personal handles. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, without further ado, shall we uh, take a a look at yeah. some, some of the the papers we want. To, well, some of the, well, we'll start with we'll the do news some stories actually. The news ones, right? Yeah, yeah. news stories. <laughs> because uh, I mean, the biggest one that happened while we we're off was uh, the uh, new uh, Russian vaccine that say they finally f published the paper. So this is what announced uh, not too long ago, where they uh, they're really really like passionate about this. I mean, everyone's giving all. You, you hear, there's lots of press release, and they're starting to give it to lots of people. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it, yeah. It's so I'm just like giggling about that. They're very passionate about this yeah. <laughs> the vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, there's a lot of like yeah, yeah very yeah. There's, yeah, there's like, like some, some sort of like intense enthusiasm, maybe desperation, desperation right? right? Like I think that's part of it as yeah. well. Like people are just want to see that things are happening. Yeah. But, but of course, the the news. I mean, not this news, but the one when we first heard about this vaccine was they didn't finish their phase three trials. <laughs> no plans for phase three trials, yeah. and so. Uh, but in there, and at the time, there were, there was even no. They just said that this phase one slash two was done, but we didn't even know what you know. The scientific community didn't even know what was up. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And it's so these are adenovirus vaccines. Yeah, right. That's right. So just like the some of the leading other leading vaccines, the Chadox is like an adenovirus. Yeah. Um, uh, has uses the same adenovirus can... five, and. Johnson and Johnson have an adenovirus 26, that version vaccine that they haven't got into phase one yet. As well, they haven't published the phase one yet, results yet. Um, mm -hmm. So this is like a mix of different things. And I mean, and, and we briefly talked about this one, too, being like, it's kind of cool because we know that there's immune responses to these adenovirus. So they give one and then they boost with another yeah. to, to try to prevent that immune con conflict. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a kind of a, a, an interesting strategy to get around. Cause I think when we're talking about the Cansano adenovirus five, they had that problem where people had that pre-existing immunity where, so they're very concerned about mm -hmm. people like, trying to get almost like giving the vaccine, but it's cleared out before it can actually cause an infection because of that pre-existing immunity. So this is because I mean, right. the probability of, of, both people having had both of these viruses, it should be a bit lower than. Um, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, the only issue is um, the, this paper. There, there's a. Uh, yeah, there's. So I'm gonna uh, pull up the. So I mean, some people actually complained about the data when it was when it came out. So a group of <laughs> uh, Italian scientists look at this, looked at the data, and see saw something they felt was quite odd. So I'm gonna. Uh, actually pull up the the slide a slide that shows yeah. the, like the the figures so these are enzyme linked as, as all, they're like here these are measurements for the antibodies so anti uh coronavirus re receptor binding domains um yeah so <laughs> you started you started saying what the assay was and you aborted yourself yes. elizas, elizas right yes. <laughs> enzyme linked immunosorbent um assay yes. 
Uh, and this assay is used to measure the amount of antibodies. So they have like uh, the antigen, I think, on there, and then they, then so the antibody will stick to it, and then they have another antibody that's linked to another like kind of thing that detects that antibody. So it's effectively makes some makes some color yeah, or something like color, that usually, which is <clears throat> it's really like kind of useful kind of technique for for biology, and it's yeah. So. I, we've seen we've we've seen a lot of yeah. this in the papers that we've been doing, right? Whatever time they're looking at neutralizing antibodies or something, uh, it's usually via some sort of ELISA test. <laughs> yeah, um, and so um, what happened was like these these scientists they looked at these studies and they they fig figured that some of the these figures looked very very similar to each other. So some of the data points looked like they were very much shared, um, mm -hmm. which. Uh, yeah, so like they point out like the in figure C, the fourteen and the twenty eight, I think something like yeah, that. They, Those time points. Yeah, um, but I mean, the issue is it almost like seemed like the way they highlighted stuff was very. It, I mean, uh, so I, I, I think I'll pull it up on the screen share just so that uh, people can see. Uh, so let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, oh, like, like the, the, the sections that are highlighted. highlighted. Yeah. <laughs> so like they so figure two they highlighted so different sections in different colors saying that oh these look very similar which in those figures they sort of look similar but actually they there's oh there's some differences there and they don't match like particularly amazingly and um and it, i think that it, it's most stark that i mean with so they did some highlights on another figure and it does seem like they they were reaching somewhat with that one um, mm -hmm. but yeah, they, but I do like kind of acknowledge that there is some sim similarity there, but I, I kind of feel that, that within this case, they were kind of, uh, not seeing the forest for the, the trees in, in terms of what their criticism was, because for, for sure. sure, yeah, because yeah. I mean, but firstly, the thing that annoyed me, cause, cause I'm, I'm, I work in research integrity. We get complaints like this all the time. And and so sometimes people will come up and say it's not statistically likely that this would happen. And usually they pr produce some statistics that I can go on, so I can say, oh, actually, mm -hmm. I can check that over. The what what happened here was they basically said it's not statistically likely this would happen, and they didn't really produce any numbers behind it. And mm -hmm. and I uh, so, uh, so it, does, it, does, it, feels it feels like, like less, less of a base, base in, reality in reality claim, claim right? right? It, it, then... feels, it feels like less. I mean, it feels. I mean, looking at it, I can sort of understand where they're coming from, but. Uh, actually, it, does, it feels like they didn't do all their homework for when mm -hmm. putting up. Because when you when you're gonna take your shot, you really want to like hit, and you want to like line up. You want to do all your like homework. <laughs> and it feels like they didn't really yeah. do that. So because the thing is, I'm inclined to be on their side on this because uh, I'm. But they they really yeah. They, it's like they took their shot on their. But at the same. But at the same time, like when you say miss the forest for the trees, I think part of that is too is that it's not whether this data is good or not, right? Because the bigger action was that based on the back of this, they went directly into like yeah. human, <laughs> human, like large scale human, well, uh, I guess distribution. But wait, I think we said this in the episode to cover this testing, yes. where they went to large scale human testing without pa going actually first through um, a larger phase three trial. Yeah, I mean <laughs> And if, and with that case, the thing that I'd be more concerned about is not so much whether the antibodies are producing a response, but whether there's any vaccine side effects. Uh, that'd be the mm -hmm. main concern. Um, yeah. Uh, but like, the thing about this is, if I compare the, this sort of data to like, so, the, so I'm gonna like take you on a journey. So I'm gonna compare this to some other like Eliza data we've seen, uh, and then oh nice. So I can so I'm taking <laughs> audience along with me as well, so that we can see whether the, what the what is actually wrong with this data or actually the reason why it seems so odd so i'm going to skip over mm -hmm. so i'm showing the chadox data where you can see uh these giant like kind of like scattergun like kind of dots where the graphs are so each dot is meant to represent an individual like kind of result for so this is done in exactly the same well supposedly done using the same uh, assay as the other study and mm -hmm. and you can see that that it looks kind of different if i look at a similar like blot done by the uh, so I'm going to move down to the CanSino one done by the Chinese group. Um, they yeah. also sh seem to show a very similar kind of spread of dots compared to the Oxford. There isn't any discrete lines like we see with the yeah. Russian vaccine. So that's mm -hmm. so um, so that's kind of the so so what actually seems to be happening is that they're doing their Elizas in a very different way to anyone else is doing their Elizas. 
Um, right. Because uh, usually, so when you're doing a dualizer, you you take an you add your antibody and it ch ch changes color, and you take like a reading of, from the optical. So it kind of the optical like reader tells you how like blue or how how much color change has happened. Yeah. And and we how blue, how yellow. Yeah. And usually you do like a dilution <laughs> series. So you dilute it's like one in ten, or even in this case maybe take half, one in two, one in three, one in four, and then you take a <laughs> measurement of the colors, and then you time and you multiply those colors by your dilution series. So so mm -hmm. you, that gives you kind of a, an idea of like how much antibody there there is. Whereas like in the mm -hmm. Russian study, all the results are almost exactly the measurement of the of the uh, of the dilution series. So. It's like every time they yeah. they took measurements <clears throat> of an optical density of one, they're all the same number. So, mm -hmm. but I was also thinking it could also be that they had a cutoff, um, and they just like they're presenting the dilution yeah. as the dot, like the dot is the dilution. Yeah, that's what I think <laughs> so yeah, so they're it's kind of like an artificial binning. It's like yeah. oh, we detected at this point, right? Was the you have it, you have it. And so like, they just use that dilution factor as the, <laughs> the amount that's in there. Yeah, <clears throat> um, ex exactly. So, where the, and so the, the question is, uh, what is the cutoff? Uh, and where, mm -hmm. and the, and that's the thing that is, and, and to be honest, n none of these studies actually are very good at t talking about what their realizers are. Uh, so I did look through like a couple of them and like, usually for realizers we'd have like a standard curve or something like that, but we, we don't really mm -hmm. see that for any of the, the studies that are coming out. I mean, the Cansano paper, for their their equivalent of this this paper, they just present a table with the standard deviation, median, and but they in like text forms. They don't show you any of the data points. So, sure, so, <laughs> even more removed than yeah. these. So, I mean, in which case, like, we it'd be kind of unfair to over penalize this paper for for the thing that because at least they're showing us the data, mm -hmm. even though. They don't show their cutoff points, and I kind of like first when I first saw this, I thought, wait, are they just eyeballing their results? Do they do their optical <laughs> reader this break down? Oh, I mean, that's I I do believe that that's like an older way of doing ELISAs, right? You just look at the minimum dilution, maybe you compare it with yeah. like a color card or something. <laughs> I don't think that yeah. that's the, <laughs> but it could be. It's, it's <laughs> weird because like if because let's say if they were like have a cutoff point as an OD of one, then they are under underestimating how good their vaccine is or. How many antibodies right. are raising? But, but but it still sort of communicates the same yeah. thing, right? Like even like even with the cutout data, like seeing this chart, you're still saying that it, it um, there's this like increase in titers, right, that are maintained between between the the 21 and 28 day time points. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think the yeah. and I think we're getting to the bottom of exactly why the why people were looking at this could immediately have that kind of response where they see. Oh wait, this these data points look very similar because they're discrete. Means that there's a lot less options for the, the data points to be in a certain position, especially if you've got like a specific mm -hmm. like average. So that means that mm -hmm. they, that since they've got very low numbers, a lot of these results will just will look very similar just uh, just because there aren't that many options. Whereas if you had came with the assumption sure. that they were using ODs very similar to to like the other papers, then you'd then it looked very very odd. So if you if I mm -hmm. assuming that okay well they're gonna do do like this is how I do them this would look very odd mm -hmm. because uh, then you mm -hmm. the, because the options for that since we're comparing comp continuous data with discrete data and yeah and <clears throat> the authors of the Russian study have come back with a commentary just like I think not not too long ago and they basically said the same thing that this is discrete data and but they un mm -hmm. unfortunately still haven't they I was hoping they'd like throw some more light on tell us what were they doing yeah <laughs> what were they doing yeah yeah because, because i actually don't really i don't, I don't see it in this, this. It might be in the supplementary but i don't really see where, where they describe um too, too much of their, their methods yeah, they, oh, oh they, they don't it's, it's like, like it's just, just like a long um uh, like narrative very, very old school paper, paper style right like the story of how it happened but it's hard to pick out the details here I mean, they, they don't describe how they do their realizers <laughs> which i was uh, initially mm. i was upset about that then i looked at the other papers and said how did they do their realizers they didn't tell us <laughs> <They don't>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything is terrible it's 2020 <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, I like this discussion. I like this discussion because I think it tells us something about like what it means to read a paper. Right. And like this idea of um, 
there, you know, everybody has their recipe for chocolate cake right, in the kitchen. <laughs> and like it gets you mostly a chocolate cake. It has like a similar flavor and stuff. But, you know, some of them are denser and some of them are like less fluffy. And like I do think that like labs maybe forget that like Eliza. Yes, that's a technique. It's like it is it, it, it has certain features, but like the details do matter, especially when we're trying to start comparing between, which, again, isn't like the most science it's not very rigorous to compare between papers like that, but that's all we got, right? Like, it's not like one lab does everything, it's all standard, like we have to see it. And so seeing methods is helping bring that standardization in, even if it's not standard, right? Like, at least we know why <laughs> we might see certain variants, right? We can make that sort of um, a, a more educated uh, assessment of the data and maybe a more educated comparison between others with that information in front of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that this is why it's kind of very important to read, read papers in depth and also like to, mm -hmm. to well, if you're going to criticize a paper, do your homework first. Just look at it and then you know exactly <laughs> sure. what what was actually wrong for a bit because otherwise yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, now, now they've got this, we've got, got that discussion that's finished now. So uh, am I going to be able to like come back and say, actually, can we all have this question answered? And it's yeah right. so is but at the end of the day i think that like the bigger problem is that like <laughs> they've really decided to sidestep like what people would consider good practice in in uh releasing a vaccine to a large yeah, amount of people because i mean if there's a side effect that could be a real problem which i think brings us to our next story yeah. which is <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh about uh astrazeneca so and so mm. uh, i'm posting up an open letter that just as the background for people to look at as posted to stat news but basically um so since we last came came to, together to talk about this astrazeneca had oh one minute it's got you know what, oh sorry sorry minor error. anyway uh so astrazeneca has ha, ha, the, the trial has been halted i think twice because uh people have come back with neurological symptoms um mm. so <laughs> the the there's been an issue of um people having like uh symptoms which no one's really got come out and said is transverse myelitis but a lot of experts have been reading about what astrazeneca has written in their press releases have said is transverse myelitis mm -hmm. or looks like it hmm. um so i mean this is this is sort of the reason right for yeah <laughs> it is a great segue in that sense yeah. right like seeing seeing these things like that's what we're supposed to be seeing at a step where you haven't just said whoever wants it can have yeah, it exactly <laughs> So, mm -hmm. and like, given that the like the, the Russian vaccine is using two different adenoviruses, it's something that you'd want to be a little bit careful of. But, um, mm -hmm. is that sorry? I don't, what is the AstraZeneca va sorry, vaccine? Uh, sorry, is no, that the AstraZeneca a... vaccine is a Chadox vaccine. Uh, so it's is the Chadox. So that's yep. the chimpanzee <clears throat> adenovirus vaccine, and mm -hmm. and and to to be honest, it doesn't necessarily surprise me that adenovirus vaccines have the so thing about adenovirus vaccines is they. So the adenovirus vector has been used to deliver DNA to cells for about 20 years, and its safety record mm -hmm. is not spotless. Um, there, mm -hmm. there have been issues with... Uh, so, because I remember when I was, like, studying, like, uh, gen gene therapy, like, so during my uh, mm -hmm. during my first, like, degree, we were, like... Uh, one of the things that they're basically very panicked about with, was with adenovirus is that they can be very immunogenic, which is what, what mm -hmm. what's been, like, people... Was, kind of a good thing for vaccines but it's kind of been a bad thing for gene therapy because they're a bit because with gene therapy you give quite big doses and a big immune response mm -hmm. can lead to fatalities it has led to a fatality in, the, in an instant right. so yeah i mean i think that that <laughs> that that was like the a lung thing right it was also yeah. i think bad bad design when you think about it like if you know that something causes inflammation and then you're targeting this surface that's kind of uh susceptible to um a, a bad outcome if like the inflammation is too bad then that was that was a mistake on their part yeah, but I think, <laughs> um, yeah the first one they were doing this 20 years ago so they really didn't know much about things at all yeah so. it was the beginning it was an excited exciting tech and then i think it really made people stop and think yeah. right because like the next time it would be done it would be under a lot more scrutiny uh probably rightfully so yeah um so yeah they and yeah i think the, the gene therapy they've been like having two strategies so what so one was to move away from using viruses entirely using viral virus like particles or those nanoparticles mm -hmm. that are being used by the by uh moderna and pfizer um mm -hmm. or using other viruses like called adeno associated viruses that uh, are supposed to be less immunogenic so 
when I was doing my PhD, those were the ones that were being used on like rats for gene therapy. But so, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, that's not to say that they, they hit they, the researchers are probably very very aware of this. Uh, they yeah. have to be. So, so that's probably they're being very careful because like if someone has a slight stomach bug while they're having the vaccine, they need to shut everything down just in case. For sure. So. <clears throat> I mean, I remember like um, th during when the HPV vaccine was rolled out and and somebody mm -hmm. like had some symptoms. I had a friend who was work working at like GSK who said, well, yeah, that she also had cornflakes for breakfast. You know, then tell, tell you about that. <laughs> he was very, he was very salty about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, again, like uh, be because, uh, you know, this is that confluence of like business, right? Like what gets reported, those things are also in fact affecting like the trading of the yeah. company and like what people choose to put into it like for scientists it's like it's easy i think to be critical which i i, th and I think we should yeah. be right like i think people should be critical of the things but yeah i can see on being in the company and hearing that kind of wild um speculation on what could be good or bad about something it's like oh my goodness like we're just trying to make this thing like <laughs> these are these are roadblocks that are you know affecting our ability to actually work on this oh yeah <laughs> i mean this is from a very biased source i mean this is yep, kind of different. Exactly. Because, like, because when I was first going to report on this story, there's only one like case of like, and then the second one popped up. Another yeah. one came up. Yeah. And then that's like, okay, well, um, this is going to be difficult to, much more difficult to explain away by by coincidence. That so. Yeah. Yep. Uh, transverse. Yeah. But again, it's good that the, it's good that these phase three trials are being done yeah. with, with them, especially when it's um, maybe a platform that hasn't been used in people yeah. before. Right. So like, yeah, so adenovirus, like I don't, uh, I, did we look up if there were other adenovirus vaccines? Uh, I don't is, think, there, I think there are gene therapies. Uh, so there's what a gene therapy for blindness okay. out there for, with adenoviruses, I think. Um, oh yeah. Lexterna, right. That's an adenovirus, yeah. <clears throat> which is weird though. Cause it's injected into the eye. So like, the immune right the immune profile is very yeah. different than like systemic circulation so, yeah, because the eye is an immune <clears throat> privileged area which means that the immune system doesn't <clears throat> usually go in there unless things go because when yep. it does because i mean because uh, uh, like usually when someone like like loses one eye that suddenly all <clears throat> these antigens are like kind of since there's a damage there it releases all these antigens into like the like kind of immune system the immune system has a response and then people lose the other eye because of that immune response so it's mm -hmm. it's one of those sorts of areas that the immune system doesn't generally t touch, and we don't really want to mess with it too much. But when yeah, in... but it also means that if you inject something in yeah. there, <laughs> it mo it won't really make an immune response because it's isolated yeah. away in a different yeah. So... Uh, yeah, so that, I mean that's a fairly new thing. So like yes, yeah, so adenovirus is still very yeah. new, like uh, very new when it comes to widespread use in yeah, people. <laughs> I mean. <clears throat> in the labs, we've been like kind of tiptoeing around using it for for a while, but yeah. Oh yeah, I mean in cell in cell culture and animals, but you know it's different yeah. when it goes in people. Because I I think one of the big things is that it can also like carry quite a lot of genetic information compared to other viruses. That so you can actually put in uh, quite a few big genes in there, whereas like smaller viruses that are less immunogenic, you have to like cut things down uh, to like make it fit mm -hmm. into the virus. Um, but, that, but, that, but that's a good yeah. thing, right? I feel like that's that gives you more design space yeah, exactly. when people are... So oh. I, that's quite good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All right. So I think we've said, like, I mean... the Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I guess I had one more. I, I mean, I'm not sure if this is a news yeah. object, but, like, um, I, it was just, like, a short, shorter paper that I saw um, published, like, uh, like, earlier in the year. Uh, the date's not on patients in earlier states exhale millions of SARS-CoV-2 particles per hour. Um, I don't think we're going to uh, end up paper because, because the data is too deep on it, but um, or like it's only a table, I think, at the end of this. Uh, but it's a it's an interesting preprint, and they um, they took exhaled breath samples of, of uh, people, people who actually have, have COVID-19, COVID um, and, and then, then they, they checked out whether, whether or not, or not uh, they, could, they could see virus, virus I think, I think from, from that. that uh, but I think they used RNA, RNA RT-PCR. So, so this stuff has been going on and on for a while. while. Um, and, and, and yeah, yeah I, think I think they were, were finding, finding that, that uh, there, there there are there is stuff that comes out um, in, in the breath. breath. Uh, I, I mean, mean, I think, I think we, we knew that, right? That's what everyone is doing. This is just like some 
<laughs> the, the data that, that comes with it. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes you do need that. Like some, like yeah, everyone assumes that people are going to be breathing out COVID, but you know, just you yeah. to, having to <clears throat> that that down and having that like written down in stone suddenly makes things a lot more like be- better to mm-hmm. to fit. <clears throat> and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe as a reminder, reminder that people, people like yeah, I, I, I think, think my biggest, biggest thing is like in, in New York, York at least, you know, things, things are changing, changing, right? People are trying to return back to normal habits, and it's really important to remember like masks, masks do help; yeah. <laughs> they, they do something, um, oh, even, even if it's just like a small reduction of risk. Yeah. Uh, and maybe for others more than yourself, that's still like a really great yeah. thing to I, do. I remember distinctly <laughs> that when I wore a mask. While I was working with fleshing bacteria, the fleshing bacteria that none of the fleshing bacteria I worked with caught me. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that PPE, yeah, yeah like yeah, when I had colleagues working for the Ebo- on the Ebola outbreak, do you know what? They didn't manage to infect their their patients with the flu or whatever they were carrying. But, but right. yeah, we definitely right. weren't wearing face masks because we thought it protected us. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I kind of like feel like well, people saying that masks don't work. I'm, I'm like, oh wow. Well, my health and safety really sold me out when I was working on with, with like dangerous bacteria. <laughs> Here, have this mask. Yeah, yeah, it'll save you. What? <laughs> now I'm hearing like ten years later, they're like, oh no. By the way, I couldn't like, oh oh, oh fuck. <laughs> oh really? Is, um. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, face masks. Of course, they they work. Um, otherwise, like, I'm otherwise like I was putting my life on the line a lot more than I should have. But just briefly, um, yeah. So I, I think that's all for the short things. Uh, next stuff we'll talk about is uh, some stuff that we're considering covering for next week, uh, diving into the papers a bit further. Yes, indeed. Uh. So, uh, uh... Okay, uh, all right, clustering and super spreading um, potential of SARS-CoV-2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a epidemiology paper uh, that I found, and uh, something came out recently. You know, uh, no, we haven't actually done a lot of epidemiology, mm-hmm. so this is seeing what these scientists do yeah. <laughs> to, to, add, to add. But um, talking about the super spreading events, yeah. uh, I, I de- this has definitely been in the news, yeah. like, earlier. Like, there have been reports of this. Um, and here's, here's like another, here's like a nice case study, I guess, uh, seeing, uh, how one is documented. Um, and yeah, I mean, like they do contact tracing and things like that, uh, to, and make some nice graphs of like who, who, who the nodes are in these things. Um, yeah. And just a story, I guess, about super spreading something important to remember. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting because sometimes, like in previous like kind of generations, we've talked about super spreaders as in for people like who spread a lot. Mm-hmm. But now with this outbreak, mm-hmm. we've shifted more to looking at events. That like there are certain events that become super spreading events. So it's less because some people yes. are like, more infectious, but more because the situations we're put in make things more infectious. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's an interesting, and also epidemiology is is one of. Those, we haven't explored it much. I haven't explored it because because I have a fear of maths, and epidemiology is mostly maths, and <laughs> it, it is, is a lot of maths. maths. <laughs> but that, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean if, if, if you, you don't, don't like, like looking at, at GWAS, <laughs> probably this, this is, is like, like even, even more down, down that line. line. Um, um, but, but it's, it's cool because it's like that, that, I, the, the data, data set is, is people, people yeah, right? Like they're, they're looking, looking at actual people in there, so there's like that fun part of the relevance. Yeah, you're right. This is something that is relevant to people because when we start thinking about how we're gonna like survive in this current like world, we have to think about what counts as a super spreading event and what what the risks what are the precautions that we can take and maybe this can mm-hmm. give us some insights into that yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean i think at the end of the day it usually comes, comes down, down to they make, make all these predictions based on some math formula and then, and then that, that math formula like you know, you know it's, it's like, like this, if, this, if this parameter was lower things would be better, better. And, and then that's like how you can assess risk though, right because that's, that's like something that's like sort of practical it's like okay like distance between people or like the frequency you know some you can't change, change right? Right? Some, some numbers, numbers are, are supposed to be like set in stone, stone by the biology of the virus, virus. But, but other, other things, things you can change and so yeah, that, that like, it, it helps in form those oh, pieces. smash mouth playing yes don't go <laughs> 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 not worth it <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah that's so that was that's something on the docket, docket. 
uh, okay, so the next one we're looking at is uh, high potency of a bivalent VH domain uh, in SARS-CoV-2 animal models. So this is basically where mm-hmm. they take a very small bit of an antibody domain and they shoot it at like a well, they don't shoot, they give it to as a treatment and they see mm-hmm. whether how well it neutralizes uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it's it's so I mean this is I mean I'm always interested in VH, VH is, is like, like smaller, smaller than, than just, just a fab. fab. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's just yeah, like, I, I, I guess, guess so. <clears throat> so I mean, it's, it's just, just like, like a small variable. It's, it's like, like one of the variable loops. It looks yeah, yeah it, it looks smaller than the full FAB. FAB. <clears throat> yeah. So I've, I've never I've, I've never heard, heard of this term. term. How, do, do you, you know, know what? what? <laughs> so, well, I've never heard about FAB. Uh, so FAB, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard about variable and light oh. variable like heavy chain and variable light chain. So so with uh, right. yeah, yeah, and this, this is, is variable heavy, heavy right? So the yeah, yeah, so, so FAB, FAB is, is like uh, the two, the, the, the two of them together make the FAB. Right. right? And, and then there's the FC region, region is, right. the, um, is the, the constant. constant. So the functional region and the, uh, yeah, because they're, they're both functional, functional in different ways, ways right? right? One, One functional, functional for against the antigen, antigen, the other functional for your body to recognize <laughs> what's gotten stuck. All right, yeah. I, so yeah, I mean, I see, kept reading, reading that as fab. Look, look at these fragments are fab. Hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> just mm, totally. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's just, just yeah, yeah, that's, that's like just, just the fragment, fragment antibody, I guess. FAB, FAB. And, and yeah, yeah and then the, the plus, plus FC equals the full antibody, antibody. And, and then, then I, I guess VH plus, plus v L, L is, is FAB, FAB. <laughs> or something, or something like, that, like that, roughly. roughly. Yeah. So I mean, I chose this because oh, they, oh, use, they use, they use two, two models. models. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they, uh-huh. they, they use, uh, yeah, they use a hamster model and the mouse ACE2 model because uh, that mm-hmm. because we we've spent like I think at least cumulative like three hours talking about this, those like models. So uh, yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. We get we to get see, to see like, like an application of something, of something. And, and, and and we, we haven't, haven't talked, talked about um, like like specifically making antibodies, antibodies as, as a therapeutic. therapeutic. Yes, right. Uh, uh, we, talk we talk about vaccines, about vaccines which, which elicit, elicit antibodies, antibodies from, from the human being. being. But, but you know, we're, we're in the age of biotechnology where you can, you can make a lot of things in a test tube. Well, I mean, in an industrial sense, like a bioreactor. Like for all intents and purposes, a test tube. It's cheap. Not a cell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just, just like, like maybe, maybe like like orders, orders of magnitude, magnitude different volumes. volumes. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, yeah, but you, but, you know, know people, people make antibodies. I'm, I'm, if, if anyone's familiar, familiar with uh, like biologics, that, that uh, category, category of, of drug, drug um, um, those, those are usually antibodies. <laughs> yeah, and the thing yeah, is yeah. that always it's like the actual like how you deliver the antibodies is is an interesting th- uh, idea because they they are big proteins and like so yeah. they always need to be delivered intravenously or yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, and, and they're and they're, and they're proteins, proteins, so they're, so they're perishable. perishable. Yeah, so they do break down. <laughs> like, so you have to make yeah, sure yeah. that they they get to the place. So, mm-hmm. I mean, drug delivery is like mm-hmm. one of the big things in biologics. I think, um, like how you get the mm-hmm. how you get your antibody to a certain place, and so this is trying mm-hmm. to solve that problem by having by shrinking down the antibody as much as possible. So yeah, makes it easier to manufacture as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, you literally like for the same amount of amino acids, you get more like. Uh, Prote- more active like good components yeah and then I, I think probably something else we'll learn from this paper because it's like specific it looks like it's looking specifically at like the binding of this vh fragment to uh to the res- or the ace2 i guess is that what it's doing or the spike the spike, spike. Yep. <clears throat> um so like we'll probably get some idea again of the structure, right? Like more more details into which surfaces bind and uh, how that inhibits the interaction between uh, spike and receptor. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see what the next one is. Okay. Uh, so we're going taking a bit of a, a detour into like hardcore like m- uh, microbiology, I guess, where we're looking at the light, uh. the what like makes this. Uh, what makes it what, how, how the coronavirus has its life cycle in the cell so mm. so in this case like we so we've talked a little bit about how spike protein allows like the coronavirus to fuse with the membrane and enter the cell mm-hmm. and like this mm. essentially ah this essentially like molecular pore. yeah <clears throat> so molecular pore spans double oh yeah sorry i forgot to tell you because you can't see my screen <laughs> I yeah, I see. I see it. It's just in a delay. Yeah. I'm seeing it through YouTube. So a molecular, a molecular pool sta- spans the double membrane uh, 
coronavirus replication organelle. Uh, is that right? Of the coronavirus mm -hmm. replication organelle. Yes. Um, yes. I love these pictures. Cryo EM. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cryo EM has like beautiful, beautiful pictures. <laughs> uh, let's show some yeah. of the audio. Cryo ET, so they even have like some 3D information. Yeah, because they're, they're like, like gently, gently wobbling, wobbling the, the stream, stream to, to get, get some, some parallax. That's, That's cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of cool, cool science in this paper, and it is just straight up like science. So no, no worrying about treatment or how this will affect our lives. This is uh, how this like specific protein works. Like what's the what are the little <laughs> mechanics of this this molecular machine, and it's. <laughs> It's a fascinating thing. So it's the kind of thing that I'd be interested in if the in the prospect if there was no coronavirus, this would be like this. Okay, so how does this virus actually work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is maybe the standard. I mean, not not necessarily with this technique, right, and with these types of pictures. But you know, people are always wondering what does this molecule do yeah. in my favorite my favorite <laughs> organism. Um, and so here, well, yeah, I guess if you can call a virus an organism, but. Uh, <laughs> What does it do in my favorite uh, biological particle, self-replicating particle? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is actually, this is very interesting. I didn't even know that uh, viruses would encode pores um, that aren't licensed. Yeah. <laughs> what is it for? Yeah, uh, it's, so, uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, da, 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 so... They have a hypothesis, probably. Yeah. yeah it, it's cool, too, because... Um, this is this w was a way in which people learned about certain things when they did a lot of TEM when that was a hot new yeah. technique, right? People uh, would tag things with particles of gold, antibodies attached to particles of gold, and then look at them under the TEM and be like, "Oh wow, we didn't realize that this thing was close to this thing." Um, and and now like the, the the microscopes have gotten better, right? Well, they give you a 3D slice image. Um, you can look at a much higher resolution, right? We're actually looking at molecules themselves. We don't even have to tag them here in this case. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they try to guess how something's working just by looking at a lot of snapshots <laughs> of, uh, of it in process. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's kind of fascinating from the process of like microbiologists. We love like viruses and bacteria, how they work. What are these little mm -hmm. machines doing? It's, but I can also understand why people, why it might, a lot of people who aren't that interested in, in microbiology will be like, well, why do you, we care about this? And we're like, well, because. Well, um, th yeah, then you rely on the stuff that you write in your grants, yeah. right? And you say, <laughs> well, you care because, like, you have no idea when um, someone will be like, oh, and by the way, I learned about this weird molecule and it plugs pores really well. So then someone puts one and one together and they're like, let's try it in some cell culture model at first. And then it moves into animals. And then all of a sudden we have a, you know, a cool new drug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and obviously the other thing is like, oh, if we understand this process, we can disrupt it and prevent it from happening. So we can pr produce drugs, drugs that can target this process. <laughs> It's all about, the it's all about the, those drugs. Like, put it in my veins. Put that vaccine in my veins. <laughs> yeah, this is. I, I mean, I, I definitely, I'm attracted to this paper because, well, <laughs> we've been saying that we talk about some sort of cryo EM because that's how they figured out the structure of the um, the spike yeah. protein, right? Um, so we could talk about this, and this is like more recent. Yeah, more recent, <laughs> and it's yeah, mm -hmm. and everyone's talking about the spike. But what are the other proteins that coronavirus talk about? I mean, they get neglected. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been up to my elbows in spike protein. It's nice to like have a change. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, I I had a paper that was I thought would be interesting to read called the coding capacity of SARS-CoV-2. Yes, uh, uh, where, where I <clears throat> we put that. Uh, and uh, that one is Finkel et al. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's go to the Zotero. And we can find that. Yeah. Uh, Finkel all. Yeah. The coding capacity of SARS CoV 2. Yeah. And in this one, I mean, it's kind of like a <laughs> what does bioinformatic, what does what like omics approach tell you? I don't think it gives us any answers, but they basically look at all the different proteins that could be made um, by having them replicate in a cell culture and then uh, looking what comes out, like what is being made by ribosomes um in those in the cells that get infected right oh right i see so yeah so i mean they just get a sense of like oh wow like here are all the different because you know um viral genomes are really small right and 
they we know like they have these major open reading frames where the proteins come from but you know uh because they're such small genomes viruses have some viruses have ways of like mix and matching between like sections to make the hybrid proteins and stuff like that so like actually knowing like what proteins are being made in infected cells is is that is something that you might not just know from looking at the sequence of a genome yeah yeah, some like viruses, they're almost like Lego bricks and they produce like components of things that come together in different ways yeah. that do perform different functions. Yeah, they're actually, exactly. Yeah, they're very, exactly. yeah, they're very lean. For so th- this, paper, this paper doesn't tell you anything about functions. It just sort of says like, look at all these pieces of things that we found in the infected cells. Um, maybe we should be asking questions about what they do. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's an interesting like idea to, to think about. Um, <clears throat> Because again, it's just emphasizing how little we know about viruses, and even though they're very small and very simple, they can still surprise us. Mm-hmm. And they, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. There's all there's all crazy things. I mean, from from the biotechnology point of view, um, like not even about disease, right? People always say, oh, viruses teach us about how our bodies work because they break something in our bodies, and then we find out like what that thing is. But like viruses themselves, because they've had to evolve in this like band of like doing things in a small amount of space, like really efficient um sequences have come out like uh like promoters and stuff and biotech it's like it is like lego yeah. bricks people are just like mix and matching the sequences they think will work together viruses have like amazing sequences right that like allow translation to begin like in the middle of a thing or at a very high level yeah. um and yeah, yeah it's, sort of... it's interesting if you're actually trying to build nano machines or small proteins that are doing some percent bunk because actually you can learn quite a lot about how to do that from looking at nature mm-hmm. and viruses are the they're very they're built to be efficient they're built to be lean they're built to not have uh, that to use up their space as much as efficiently as possible which is kind of what we want to do if we're doing some, something similar so there's yeah absolutely um <clears throat> so yeah there is that um okay so i had like so, uh, so next up i'm going to be talking about uh t-cells um so going so we talked mm. a bit about the immune system but i think this is kind of like interesting so the one first one i'm looking at is robust t-cell response towards spike membrane and nucleocapsid SARS-CoV-2 proteins is not associated nice. with a recovery in critical COVID-19 patients, which... This is great. This is something that we asked when we were reading about, yeah. right? When we were reading about antibody responses and T-cell responses, we were like, and can we have more data, right? Yeah. To know, like, is what's predictive for these different states, right? Like, what makes for good um, immune response? And sometimes they get that with convalescent serum, um, but here they're getting just blood samples, I think, from people. Yeah, I think, I think, <clears> so. <throat> I think they're, um, let me, uh, yeah. So, okay, hold on a minute. Uh, my scroll, um, I can't uh, scroll down, unfortunately, but yeah, I think that that's basically what's happening with this. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so I found this one kind of interesting because it, it, it kind of builds on what we're saying about the B cell. Then I saw another paper that was published around the same time that basically says the opposite. Which says that, oh. which says that that T cells are really important to the, the immune response. So that one is, is still loading at the moment. Um, okay, uh, is that antigen specific adaptive immunity to SARS CoV two in acute COVID nineteen and associations with age and disease severity. So ah. um, in this one, they look at um, they look at T cell responses in in different like patient groups, and they find that. In the elderly patients where they don't have very good like T cell responses, they tend to uh, have wor- worse responses to SARS-CoV-2. So, because uh, I, you know, if you saw these headlines almost like next to each other, like side by side, like, <laughs> where like so one saying, "Oh yeah, T cells are really important to the SARS-CoV-2 response," and the other one saying, "T cells response aren't r- really useful." Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's the news, like, that's the news environment we're in now, right? We're, like, so close to the data as it's being published, right? Like, competing groups of scientists with their own hypotheses and ways of working are trying to figure out what's going on. And, of course, um, there will be conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> there will be things that come. So, yeah. this is, like, another one in, like, oh, God, immunology. <laughs> like, this is, because, mm. yeah, it's so complicated. Sure. They could both be true. That's how weirdly complicated immunology is. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they could both be true. And there's some special process that governs the connection that we just don't quite understand at this point. But we talk about them as if they're silos. <laughs> but there's some yeah, cr- cr- crosstalk that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so 
this, this is if you want to do because I know like last time we did like a two hour show on like immunology so <laughs> we can yeah, like, dip maybe. into these if we want to go back into the immunology is kind of frustrating show <laughs> but right right <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, these at least these ones are these ones are advancing to uh, yeah. I guess similarly to that long show, it's like it advances the certain hypotheses yeah. right within the framework of immunology as we know it. And um, in the future, it could be shown that like <laughs> immunology as we know it is actually different, and so the hypotheses will change a little bit. Yeah. But all of these stories are paths are like building blocks along that way to changing how we talk about immunology potentially. Yeah, I mean, much love to any immunologist watching. <laughs> I don't envy you. You've got a really hard job, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, so those are kind of very interesting, and of course, immunology is, relates to vaccines, herd immunity, and all sorts of really important things. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> um, I, I guess that might be related to a paper that I was interested in called uh, "A Neutrophil Activation Signature Predicts Critical Illness and Mortality in COVID-19." Um, so, you know, everyone wants to know how to detect things faster, yes. like what, how to identify the patients that will go down quicker. Um, you know, we know that immunology has like a ton of different things that are being made and like cell types and cytokines floating around. So I believe in this paper, they use some sort of, um, machine learning perhaps, or like, uh, yeah, some sort of computer assisted way to sift through that information and try to find things that correlate together yes oh. um, so, yeah good old machine learning which is uh <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah it's interesting because like because the thing about machine learning is that there, there's it's hard to actually like yeah so no one knows why yeah. it's like yeah. it, it's not it's not telling us like this is why these things are important it's like well based on crunching all this information right this might be um this might be a marker i don't know yeah. why you, know, you don't know why I it mean, is. yeah you computer get, told me so it depends, yeah because it really depends on like, the kind of algorithm you give it to because there, there are a couple of different ones out there and depending on what they are they don't actually tell you the logic for they can either tell you like their logic for finding it or they 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 lot or they, it's very hard to decipher what how they came to their conclusions, which makes it. Yeah, quite... I think even if they tell you their logic, it's still not easy. It it's not like human mm. interpretable. It's not like you can map that onto a hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, it can be very very difficult to to do that and to figure out exactly what is because sometimes machines can like pick up on lots of different subtle information that humans tend to to ignore, which is mm -hmm. very good, but also mm -hmm. means that it's very like frustrating when you've got machines that pick up on everything you need to like figure out you almost mm -hmm. have to do this extra like project of finding out how what what you, the algorithm is doing um yeah it would be nice to see like if they how they um do the verification like you know like i, I mean we haven't talked about anything like this um yeah yeah the use of machine learning and uh i think it's interesting to people because it's like you know everyone I, I mean i don't believe it but people often say like oh everything's data right you reduce everything down to data and like that's why machine learning is going to change the world and and yes but then there's also like the physical world that you can re-verify things in and um it's a nice the, opportunity the, maybe to talk about those yeah, things. yeah everything is data but think about like everything being data is like even the stuff that's crap but even stuff that's irrelevant is also data <laughs> and that's right and yeah you yeah, shovel it true. all into the machine it's so it's so i mean the garbage in garbage out sort of is the main thing that you always, always always people have to worry about with machine learning like is it are these all relevant or are they is a machine absolutely is, is a machine reacting absolutely. this way because someone put a stuffed teddy bear next to the computer while it was uh, working or not yeah so it's yeah. Um, but but I I mean I love I love that analogy. I also just want to say like, but even like garbage data, it doesn't have to be like something totally unrelated. Yeah. Garbage data could also be like, oh, and it was actually collected by two different people, and that was never recorded. And like now we're seeing differences between these samples, but it's really because it's between the people who collected the data, right? Like they did something slightly different that wasn't recorded. That's the I think, um, yeah, machines only see what you show them as well. Yeah. So I mean, because because mm -hmm. in my like. In my like like day job, I do work for like an, an engineering like a computer visioning jo mm. vision job. So I have to, so I, I do like well, I don't understand all of machine learning. I do hear a lot of the gripes without, yeah, <laughs> about like yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, about all the different. I mean, I remember like talking about about the, with one one person about like the difficulty people have in like untangling the logic of like self-driving cars and why everyone's really concerned about that <laughs> because. 
because because uh-huh. sometimes machine learning will do what you want like in like a thousand percent of situations except for one time when one thing that no one could ever see out of nowhere will like oh, okay this car ran that person down because a person was eating mcdonald's next door or something like it's, it's like <laughs> uh, but we digress yeah, I, I digress <laughs> but with, but yeah it's, i mean well i do appreciate to expose my my vast amount of ignorance on machine learning uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know anymore, but I know a lot less when I, since I started talking to people who actually work in machine learning. Totally. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a big field. It's, 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 a, a, big it's field. a big field, but it's, it's a good one. Uh, let's see what other things are there that we've... Um, ah, orally, bio- orally bioavailable broad-spectrum antiviral inhibits SARS-CoV-2 mm-hmm. and multiple endemic, epidemic, and bat coronavirus. So... Yes. So this one, it's the data is just from I think do they do animals and maybe they don't view animals. Yeah. They definitely do uh, cell culture. <laughs> um, but yeah, like an early, uh, like an early identification of um, another potential uh, therapeutic. Um, it's a nucleoside analog, so like we're sort of in that realm of remdesivir uh, stuff that uh, interacts with the polymerase of. Uh, of coronaviruses yeah. and coincidentally these other viruses as well yeah i mean this is it's a great target i think because those those rna polymerase primary all the lots of viruses use rna polymerases and this dream of having a broad spectrum antiviral has been around for a while mm-hmm. and those polymerases have been the target mm-hmm. so you've got things like favipiravir yes. remdesivir and I, they first i mean at first i first heard about these when the in the first ebola about, outbreak that happened in like 2014 or something like that when yes. they were shifting those yes. out and mm-hmm. hearing about them again now that we've got coronavirus and ebola virus is having another comeback because 2020 um mm-hmm. uh so <laughs> god i can't wait for 2021 the year when, when things get <laughs> worse <of> somehow <laughs> but yeah. So um, yeah. So basically, it, I guess it has been a goal, right, of healthcare to come up with something like this. So uh, yeah. the next iteration, yeah, the next story in that line. Yeah, we've had broad spectrum anti- antibiotics against bacteria for a while, so I think it's time that we had mm-hmm. some for mm-hmm. for viruses. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let's see whether there's anything else on the Zotero that we'd like to bring. I mean, there's there's always, always some like. Uh, there's a bunch of like uh, new trials. I mean, we can yes. actually go into the Russian vaccine trial, but I don't really particularly think that it'd be. It take. I think we've said all we really wanted to say about it. Um, yeah, there's the Novavax trial. Yes, Novavax trial. They um, they've got. Uh, so. So a recombinant spike. Oh, nanopro- nanoparticles yeah, so, is what that is. Yeah, nanoparticles. They've got like little bits of the spike protein on these like. Uh, uh, so matrix, I think this matrix nanoparticle that kind of presents supposed to present it on the surface. Um, oh, that's, that's cool. cool. I think that's it's interesting. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and so that's kind kind of cool. That's interesting. I mean, it's the only. But but the data but, but the data, data is just, just um, like, like clinical, clinical trial, trial data, data which, which, which we've, we've seen, seen at some point. point. We've 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 so <laughs> you, you can look at, tune into our Chadox episode, and I think you'll yeah. probably yeah. get a hint of like what you what you need to expect. Yeah. What you would expect talking about a paper like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, is this is this a, a potent neutralizing antibodies from COVID nineteen patients to find multiple targets? Brewer at all? Ooh, okay. <clears throat> uh, let's take a look at that. Multiple targets of vulnerability. It's a science paper. Uh, yeah, it looks like I think this is a. I think this might be a published version of something that was a preprint before. Yeah. Um. And it's looking at yeah, like where do the antibodies bind to? Ooh. In from three convalescent patients, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, yeah. I think showing that the people who recover maybe have similar right. I remember the title. There was something about like uh, convergent evolution or something like yeah. this. This idea that it's like the same and like. In convalescent people, uh, antibodies m- may be recognizing very similar antigens. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's because uh, I know that, that 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 for a lot of studies they've been doing that with the spike protein. So it'd be interesting to look at the other targets of vulnerability. I, 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 I think, think I think this, this is, is spike, spike protein. protein. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's yeah. just another spike protein paper. 
Yeah, yeah I, don't I don't think, think they're, they're looking, looking broadly, broadly against, against everything. everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're saying, saying SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 B-cell, B-cell receptors. receptors. They're, they're not really saying... saying... No, but, but then, then they, they use respect for binding domain at the end. end. Yeah, I... Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, they, they, they like, like dive, dive into, into RBD, RBD afterwards, afterwards, so I think, so I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's spike So yeah, protein. I think this, we're at that point where we've got enough papers focusing on spike protein to say, yeah, spike protein! We, mm-hmm. we, if we can mess with spike protein, we can really mess with the coronavirus. So I think we right, can right, mess with right, coronavirus right, the right. spike protein, the RNA-dependent like polymerase complex, um, and maybe there'll be other things we can figure out a little yeah. yeah. Well, we, well, talked, we talked about that. that. It, was it was very, very loose. Uh, but when we were talking about the ACE2 receptor, receptor, there was the protease, protease things. things. I, think I think that's, that's actually that's, that's something from like a past week that we could that we we, we could, could talk, talk about. about. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's like the the whole like kind of how fusion happens, uh, where, which requires so TMPRSS2. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, I like. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that, 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 that was the paper we read, but. In, in I guess, I guess in, in that, that group, group if, if in, in the, the small molecule folder of the Zotero, Zotero there's, there's structure-based, structure-based design, design of antiviral, antiviral drug, drug candidates targeting the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll get intentions, small molecule. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, it, yeah, okay. It's, it's under, under interventions. interventions. Small molecule. Um, small small molecule. Diet di- mm-hmm. all. Um, diet di- di- all. Yep. yep. Again, Again, structural, structural biology, biology uh, a, different a different protein, protein though, right, right, the protease, protease. so it's, so it's that, that pre-processing, yeah. and then and basically, basically a strange, strange computer, computer, their computer, computer methods, methods in this, this case, case. Um, I, believe, I believe, maybe, maybe they're, they're verified, verified. Uh, yeah, 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 I guess, I guess they're, they're verified, verified inside, inside of a biochemical assay, assay. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, yeah figuring, figuring out, out like, what, what might fit into the spaces of these things that would gum up the proteins. Yeah, yeah, then, then they, they do, do in vitro, vitro testing. testing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I guess we're coming to the point where we sl- try to choose which paper we want to go go through with. Yeah, yeah we, should we should choose something. something. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 think I think let's, let's not, not do immunology, immunology because we, we did do like, like a really long immunology, immunology one last time. time. Um, <laughs> I'm, up I'm up for something, something else. else. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm actually feeling, feeling that, that. I'm feeling that poor one. one. Oh, yeah, I'm feeling uh, that poor one as well. I think... Oh yeah, because yeah, 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 again, it's, we, haven't we haven't done. done we, always we always say structural, structural biology. biology. There's, there's the, the, at, at this point, point there's, there's been the spike structural, structural biology one we could do, do but, we but we also, also talk, talk a lot about the spike in a lot of different, lot of different yeah, contexts. Context. Um, um, let's, let's talk, talk about, about another, another thing. Different and yeah, we don't have to let the YouTube algorithm rule what we do. We can rebel. <laughs> it's, it's still, still SARS-CoV-2. That's, that's still hot. Yeah, it's still hot. <laughs> that's, that's, it's still it's happening. happening. Yeah, it, this will appeal to all three people who watch this. But <laughs> but the important thing is that they won't be like going because there are plenty of other people who are like, oh, I'm bored of SARS-CoV-2. More spike protein. Boo. But, but wait, what's this? Yeah. How yeah. does it work? What does it do inside the, the body? Look, exactly. fancy computer generated images. Yeah, yeah 3D. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I like that. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. So, if you at home want to read along to, about how coronavirus replicates, how it manipulates, you use, use your own body's chemistry against you, then this is the, the one we want to look at. So, a molecular pore spans double membrane of uh, the coronavirus replication organelle. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, uh, if you, in, the in the course of reading, reading it, you have, have any questions or, or you know, thoughts, thoughts that you, you want to tweet, tweet us, us uh, please, please do, do, and uh, we'll, we'll try, try to incorporate it in, 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 our, in our discussion, discussion that week. week. Next, next week. week. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, yep. Um, I've been Faz Lam at Defective Brain. And, <laughs> and I'm Danny Chan at ID Eater. Yeah. I think the hashtag is best. I would want people on the hashtag, ideally, I think. But yeah, if you have any questions about the, the topic of the show or the next paper, then feel free to tweet us and we'll talk about it in our next mm-hmm. episode. And we'll also be delving really deep into this paper. Uh, a molecular pool spans the double membrane of the coronavirus replication organelle. And the link will be in the description so you can read before you come up. And next week we'll be discussing it. And yeah, it'll be it'll be a real, real fun time. Yep, sounds great. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for joining me, Danny. Uh, I'll see you next week. Same.